The New Japan by Toru Hoshi An article from the November 1897 issue of Harper's Magazine This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org The New Japan by the Japanese Minister to the United States. It has been charged that recent events have revealed a tendency toward self-glorification in the Japanese character. The writer trusts that nothing in these pages will lend color to such a criticism. They contain the expression of his personal views merely, and while they recapitulate much that his country has already done, they will fall far short of the object he has in view if they convey the impression that he or any thoughtful japanese believes that what has been done amounts to the full measure of national development which they hope to see japan attain the air of romance which japan's immersion from the seclusion of centuries has thrown around her is a favorite topic of popular comment this is natural no doubt but i trust that the time has come when the romance in japan's career will not be allowed to obscure the less picturesque but more important facts of her actual progress it is true that forty years ago japan emerged from a state of almost total isolation and that within a very brief space of time a political system distinctly medieval and feudal in many of its features was changed to one more in harmony with the present age but this although perhaps the most striking phase of recent japanese history was by no means the result of accident or of unguided impulse. Japan did not attain her present stage of national development by a theatrical coup. The germ of her modern progress is to be found in her ancient institutions. Her people underwent no sudden or radical transformation when they abandoned the old order and took up the new. Not they, but the conditions of their environment, changed. No doubt, the versatility and adaptability which characterized them as a race aided them in conforming to the new conditions but equally without question their ancient national training and traditions exercised a potent influence only a brief review of the state of affairs in japan prior to the time of commodore perry's expedition is needed to show that the anomalous position of the nation at that time had become untenable not only for external but also for internal reasons everyone is familiar with the form of government under which the empire was then ruled it has been usual to term it a dual sovereignty wherein the tenno mikado exercised one set of functions and the shogun tycoon another but in reality whatever might be said of the possession of actual power the tenno alone or as we now say the emperor was regarded as the real fountain of all authority. The attitude of the people toward the imperial family, which had ruled in unbroken succession for centuries, was one of genuine reverence. So much so that the powerful Tokugawa clan, which held the shogunate for two centuries and a half, always maintained the greatest outward semblance of respect toward the imperial throne and its prerogatives. It is true that the great Ieyasu, the founder of the Tokugawa clan, and his grandson, the almost equally great Iemitsu, framed the system under which the actual power of the imperial house was reduced to a shadow. But neither the one nor the other, even in the plenitude of the great authority wielded by each of them, felt strong enough to brave the popular storm which would have followed any hostile action against the throne. This may not seem especially significant now, but it certainly had peculiar significance at a time when dynastic changes were the rule rather than the exception in other parts of the world. If the reader will recall the number of such changes which have occurred in Europe even since the Middle Ages, and will then remember that in Japan, long before that time and ever since, the reverence and loyalty of the people have recognized but one genuine source of imperial authority, he will doubtless admit that this sentiment cannot fail to have been a potent factor in Japan's progress. A people swayed by feelings of devoted loyalty, who, under the guidance they respect and revere, 
are willing to enter boldly upon new and seemingly hazardous experiments to toil much and if need be to sacrifice much cannot but accomplish a great deal let me hasten to explain that i am not attempting to arrogate to my countrymen any especial merit or to claim for them qualities that other men do not possess i only mean to say that one of the ancient as well as the present advantages which japan possesses is this fortunate relation between the throne and the people the undeviating loyalty of the people to the throne made possible the complete revolution in the control of public affairs which occurred in eighteen sixty eight the same sentiment of confidence and devotion eased the progress of the nation through the changes some of them drastic and far-reaching which occurred thereafter and to-day it stands forth pre-eminent as the strongest guarantee of the permanence of national development i do not need to point out here how fully this feeling has been reciprocated and repaid by the wise and beneficent leadership which has guided japan to the place among nations which she occupies to-day that will naturally form another part of the narrative of japan's progress my present object is merely to enumerate some of the reasons for that progress not always borne in mind by those who note its results without studying its causes it is usual to designate the government of ancient japan as a despotism broadly speaking the definition is not wholly incorrect but in certain essential details it fails to give an exact idea of the political system which prevailed in japan from the end of the sixteenth to the middle of the nineteenth century the tokugawa shogunate was the real governing power but it maintained most peculiar relations on the one hand with the throne and on the other with the territorial nobility as already intimated the shogunate never dared openly to violate or to offend the popular reverence for the imperial family the court at kyoto was gradually shorn of all actual power but this was done by means of cunning pretexts having all the appearance of loyalty still the line of sovereigns enthroned at kyoto always remained a menace to the usurper an effectual bar to his full assumption of power and a rallying point for national loyalty and patriotism as regarded the territorial nobility daimyo an equally anomalous condition of things existed for example so far as the details of administration were concerned the territorial extent over which the powers of the government of the shogunate were operative was limited to the domains under the direct sway of the shogun himself the territories under the control of the daimyos even including the fifths held by the junior branches of the tokugawa family enjoyed almost complete autonomy such measures as were necessary to control the feudal lords and to prevent them from acquiring dangerous independence were enforced by indirect methods rather than openly but otherwise they enjoyed in their respective domains the rights and prerogatives of independent sovereignty they could not declare war conclude peace or coin money but they exercised autonomous control in almost all other important matters pertaining to the executive power of a state the system of semi-independence extended also to other classes of the population the predominant influence acquired in the course of time by the military order is a matter of common knowledge but it is not so well known that the farmer the merchant the craftsman and others of the common people enjoyed under the law rights and privileges lesser in degree and in extent but equally well recognized and respected the communal and municipal systems established from early days afford an example of this within certain limits the people of the cities towns villages and rural neighborhoods controlled their own local affairs this control formed an important part of the governmental machinery and although the limits of its operation were circumscribed it could not but have contributed to the formation of a certain independence in the national character and of some degree of familiarity with the fundamental principles of self-government respect for law and instinctive obedience to its mandates have always been notable characteristics of the japanese people to such an extent is this the case that some foreign critics attribute to us the tendency to over-legislation as a national foible however that may be 
it is easy to see what a most useful purpose this quality has served in the critical period through which japan has passed since the restoration happy for us that by tradition and by immemorial usage the law has held such a high place in the estimation of our people without this solid sentiment to depend upon there have been times when the path of our national progress might have remained indefinitely obstructed by obstacles which only unquestioning obedience to the law could aid in removing it is interesting to note that this national characteristic also descends to us from ancient times in japan the rules of rank were rigorously enforced but no man no matter how high his station was above the law and none so humble that he might not safely appeal to it as is well stated in the narrative of commodore perry's expedition however absolute may have been the authority of the shogun in the beginning it has subsequently been very much modified and certain it is that at this day the reign of the shogun is by no means arbitrary he cannot do just what he pleases the laws of the empire reach him as much as they do the meanest subject although this was written at a time when the prestige of the shogunate had appreciably declined it may safely be taken as a correct presentation of what was the case even at a much earlier date and so far as regards the impartial enforcement of the law and the universal deference shown to it the same conditions prevail in japan today this national characteristic joined to the loyalty of the people and to the spirit of independence fostered by circumstances already described goes far toward explaining the apparent ease and rapidity with which japan has accomplished some of the changes which have attracted the world's attention do not understand however that i intend to convey the impression that these qualities alone were sufficient to effect a complete transformation in the social and political conditions by which japan had been so long enthralled they are cited merely as examples of some of the influences which have aided in bringing that transformation to the point it has now reached it is superfluous to say that no people could remain for more than two centuries wholly aloof from the rest of the world without suffering harm from the isolation that was the case with japan but happily for her people the unnatural seclusion in which they had lived had not sapped all the forces of national vitality enough remained to overcome the inertia developed by the past and to gather force for an advance the ancient national spirit loyal law-abiding and independent was a powerful ally in the struggle for reform and afforded a solid basis for a feeling of confidence in ultimate success even under the most discouraging circumstances the restoration of eighteen sixty eight found the empire in a disordered and impoverished condition the resumption of all the imperial prerogatives by the emperor and the relegation of the shogun to private life were not the results of a sudden uprising or of a hastily planned revolution the seeds of discontent had been long sown the fruit was long in maturing the government of the shogun had served its appointed purpose and was tottering to its fall doubtless it would have gone down in any event before internal feuds and domestic dissensions but strangely enough the immediate cause of its overthrow was one of the most creditable acts of its existence the conclusion of the treaties with foreign powers the japanese conservatives of that day objected strenuously to what they termed foreign intrusion and the successful agitation against the shogunate was largely due to their initiative but that the prejudice against foreigners did not extend to the leaders of the movement was shown conclusively by subsequent events their aim was the destruction of the illogical and unwieldy dual form of administration and the centralization of the powers of government under its legitimate head to accomplish this they availed themselves of all the various forms of discontent and opposition to which the anomalous administrative conditions then prevailing had given rise the anti-foreign clamor among the rest but the true motive underlying the movement to restore the imperial prerogatives was manifest at the outset and long before the design had been successfully consummated 
it was declared by the emperor himself when on march fourteenth eighteen sixty seven in the presence of court nobles and feudal lords he made solemn oath that from that time forth administrative affairs should be decided by general deliberation that both government and people should labor for the good of the nation that the evil customs hitherto prevailing should be corrected and that the country should be strengthened by adopting the systems of defense employed in foreign lands this oath as was clearly understood was intended to be the foundation of constitutional government one of the first acts of the emperor after the restoration was the promulgation of an edict abolishing the laws against foreign religions and their propagation among the people hence it came to pass that for the first time in centuries the doctrine and tenets of christianity could be freely preached and taught in japan mention of this momentous event naturally suggests some consideration of the question of religious faiths in japan and of their influence upon the intellectual and moral growth of the nation one interesting fact immediately discloses itself and that is that up to the time when japan was close to the world foreign religions had not only been tolerated but had even been eagerly welcomed and espoused this is notably true of christianity and buddhism the latter was introduced about 552 a d until that time shintoism was the only religion of the people the coming of buddhism as one of our historians says wrought a complete change in the mind of the nation hitherto the people's conception of religion had been of a most rudimentary character they merely believed that the gods must be revered relied on and feared in their simple faith they attributed every happy or unhappy event every fortunate or unfortunate incident to the volition of the deities to whom therefore they offered sacrifices that evil might be averted the transition from pantheism of this description to belief in a faith which inculcated virtue and well-doing and announced the doctrine of future rewards and punishments might naturally be regarded as difficult but it was accomplished in japan in a surprisingly brief period the introduction of buddhism did not however destroy reverence for the ancient shinto faith the two existed side by side in some cases they were even partially amalgamated through the skillful adoption by buddhist propagandists of some features of the shinto belief as a part of the buddhist tenets buddhism in japan as elsewhere was divided into many sects some of whom adhered to the practice of self-denial and to the ascetism inculcated by the original teachings but buddhism in general became more and more a religion of outward display of gorgeous vestments and pompous observances wherein the ceremony was placed before the essence of worship shintoism on the other hand retained its original simplicity and its doctrines were clarified rather than perverted with the lapse of time still it never had a hold upon the people as a popular religion but existed rather as a cult among the educated few christianity was introduced into japan by portuguese missionaries in the latter half of the sixteenth century the jesuits were the first to enter the field followed within a short interval by the dominicans like buddhism the new faith was welcomed and soon spread rapidly without check throughout the southwestern part of the empire the missionaries were kindly received by the shogun hideyoshi who was noted no less for his moderation than for his ability but the spirit of intolerance which their teachings seemed to arouse and the sectarian quarrels leading to serious disorders which ensued exhausted his patience and he issued an edict forbidding the propagandism of the foreign faith the law however was not rigorously enforced but remained practically a dead letter until iyasu became shogun when a new edict was issued expelling the foreign missionaries and commanding japanese converts to abjure their faith on pain of exile or death then ensued a series of conflicts assuming at times the proportions of civil war which terminated in the extinction alike of the foreign religion and of its devotees however much we may deplore this episode 
it should not be forgotten that the Japanese Christians were not victims of religious intolerance or persecution. They suffered for political reasons, because the manner in which their religion was propagated appeared to entail the gravest danger to the public tranquillity, and to menace even the safety of the government. Humble and conciliatory at first, the foreign propagandists became arrogant with success. They sought to extend their influence to secular affairs, and, where other means failed, they were not averse to proselytism by the sword. They quarreled bitterly among themselves, Jesuits against Dominicans, each striving to thrust the other out of the field, by the same means which were finally employed for the expulsion of all. Happily, this dark chapter in Japanese history was closed forever, and the new era of religious freedom begun, with the removal of ancient restrictions. Christianity has again spread to every part of the empire, and freedom of conscience is assured, not alone by public sentiment, but also by an express stipulation in the Constitution itself. The question of religion has always played an important part in determining the relations of Christian and non-Christian countries. The former deal with each other upon terms which they will not grant to the latter. The two do not meet upon an equal footing, but one demands from the other capitulations and guarantees which imply a certain degree of moral inferiority. In the past, the custom was doubtless founded upon solid and sufficient reasons, but so far as Japan is concerned, I believe it is not presumptuous for us to claim that it is no longer operative. We may not be a Christian nation in the strict sense of the expression, but we have omitted no effort to assimilate to our use the substance of Christian civilization. We adhere to no form of bigoted religious belief which inculcates unreasoning intolerance or the feeling of fancied superiority over others. On the contrary, we cherish the spirit of tolerance not only because it is morally right but also because it is the surest safeguard against that slothful inertia which blind adherence to a narrow creed must produce. So far as the law and unrestricted liberty can accomplish it, the mind of the nation is open to the truth. Time and the manifold influences of an enlightened and progressive age must do the rest. The attitude of the leading minds of the nation is well expressed in the following extract from the commentary on the Constitution. Freedom of conscience concerns the inner part of man, and lies beyond the sphere of interference by the laws of the state. To force upon a nation a particular form of belief by the establishment of a state religion is injurious to the natural intellectual development of the people, and prejudicial to the progress of science. No country possesses by reason of its political authority, the right or the capacity to enact an oppressive measure touching abstract questions of religious faith. The reorganization of the whole fabric of public administration was one of the first cares of the imperial government after the restoration. It is not necessary to set forth in detail here all the changes which were made. It may be said in general terms that the aim was to establish an administrative system based as far as practicable upon Western models. As a necessary result, the feudal lords surrendered their fiefdoms to the central government, and all the administrative powers and functions which had hitherto been widely distributed among subordinate dignitaries and officials were concentrated under the imperial control. One of the most significant changes was the abolition of hereditary office and the elevation of men of comparatively low rank to offices of the highest dignity and influence. Such other changes as experience showed to be necessary were adopted from time to time, until in 1885 the present executive system was established. It consists of a cabinet composed of the ministers of the several executive departments presided over by the Prime Minister, and of a Privy Council, which acts in an advisory capacity. The Empire is divided into prefectures under governors appointed by the central government. Constitutional government was established in Japan in 1890. 
it was the direct result of the promise made by his majesty in the solemn oath above recorded and was a spontaneous gift of some of the imperial powers and prerogatives to the people steps had been taken previously to pave the way for the adoption of parliamentary institutions by extending the rights and privileges of the people most notably by the creation of the prefectural assemblies which exercise a certain degree of control over local affairs whether or not such measures were of essential value it is not necessary to inquire in this place in any case it can now be truthfully stated that parliamentary government in japan has passed the experimental stage and is established among the permanent institutions of the land of course this has not been accomplished without friction between the executive and legislative branches of the government political storms rage in japan just as in other countries but the new institutions have stood the strain of all conflicts every such struggle has been carried on scrupulously within the limits defined by the constitution and every disputed question has been settled in accordance with its provisions the constitution is revered by the people as the foundation of the self-government graciously conferred upon them by their sovereign and its mandates are universally regarded as sacred and inviolable the improvement of the law and the elevation of the judiciary were among the earliest reforms undertaken by the imperial government the laws have been thoroughly systematized and codified in harmony with the principles of western jurisprudence so also the judicial organization has been placed on the highest possible plane the judiciary has been made entirely independent by constitutional guarantee and no effort has been spared to ensure the ability and the rectitude of its members the question of public education has received the most careful attention a complete system of schools has been established in every part of the empire including primary middle and normal up to the university of tokyo nor has any distinction been made between the sexes but schools have been founded for the education of women as well as of men besides there are a number of private educational establishments both secular and denominational some of an ordinary grade but others of a very high class the material progress which japan has made is too well known to require detailed explanation public works of all description have been diligently pushed and private enterprise has ably seconded the efforts of the government railways steamship lines manufactories mining agriculture commerce in a word all the enterprises and pursuits that add to national wealth and prosperity have been promoted and fostered until today japan occupies a most enviable position in all these regards in like measure our fiscal system has been made the subject of careful study and of improvement wherever possible all are familiar with the recent adoption of the gold standard by japan that is only one example of many important trials and experiments relating to the national finances which circumstances have from time to time forced our government to make the question of national taxation in particular has been complicated and perplexing after the restoration an entirely new system of national finance had to be constructed this was successfully accomplished under very great difficulties not the least was that regarding the method of levying the taxes and distributing the burdens of the public revenue under the shogunate the land bore almost all the burden of taxation the rate having been from forty to fifty per cent of the gross income now however the revenues are derived from many other sources by means of diversified taxation so applied as not to bear too heavily upon any special class or avocation the land tax is only two and one half per cent on a very low estimate of the net income and the taxation per capita is not quite seven yen or about three and one half dollars it is sometimes alleged that undue prominence is given to militarism in japan that however is a mistake 
the profession of arms did at one time carry with it great privileges but that time has passed in fact one of the greatest difficulties which confronted the imperial government at the time of the restoration and for some years after arose from the presence of an influential class among our people i might almost say the predominant class soldiers by birth and training some of whom were loath to surrender the peculiar immunities and prerogatives which had been enjoyed by the caste for centuries that difficulty was overcome in time and its recurrence was prevented by the law of conscription which makes every one in the empire from the highest to the lowest liable to military service at present we have a well-organized army and a good navy but we maintain and strengthen them as a means of defense and not of offense our national policy in this respect has been uniform and consistent throughout it is the policy enjoined by the emperor in 1867 to strengthen the country by adopting the means of defense employed in foreign lands there have been occasions in our history when we sadly felt the need of such strength and now that we have the opportunity to acquire it we would fall far short of what we owe to the honor and the safety of our country if we did not utilize it but this in no wise implies the presence of an aggressive or a quarrelsome spirit we have done no more in the way of strengthening our military and naval resources than the most ordinary caution demands of a people situated as we are and confronted by the potentialities of danger to which japan is exposed the steering events which followed immediately after the restoration appeared for the time being to give undue prominence to the spirit of militarism but our progress since then has been greatest on other lines and today the military establishment has only its appointed place in the body politic with no greater privileges or power than of right belong to it naturally the army and the navy hold a high place in the nation's regard but it is one they have earned by proving themselves the patriotic and obedient instruments of the will of the state any commentary upon japan's progress since the restoration would be incomplete which did not give some account of the revision of her conventional relations with western powers the perry treaty of eighteen fifty four supplemented by the treaty of eighteen fifty eight negotiated on behalf of the united states by mr townsend harris was followed by treaties with the principal european powers framed on substantially the same lines under these compacts japan was bound by the conditions which it is usual to include in treaties with oriental nations involving among other things the surrender of jurisdiction over foreigners within her territories and the restriction of her right to levy and collect imposts and taxes in excess of rates agreed upon these treaties moreover contained favored nation clauses which were so broadly construed that amelioration of any part of the instruments was practically out of the question hence it followed by the construction insisted upon by most of the powers that japan must continue to remain bound by the treaties no matter how odious and burdensome they might have become so long as even a single power objected to a change under these treaties also the empire was closed to foreign residence and travel although the government did subsequently permit foreigners to travel in the interior for stated periods and certain specific objects strictly speaking the citizens and subjects of the treaty powers could only live at the open ports within closely defined limits it needs no argument to demonstrate that this condition of affairs was unnatural undoubtedly it was necessary at first but in time it might very well have been modified to the advantage of all concerned some of the treaty powers notably the united states as the circumstances of japan changed manifested willingness to agree to terms more in harmony with the altered conditions but others were reluctant and for years nothing resulted from japan's earnest efforts to secure a revision of her treaties but as time passed the pressing need of some solution of the question became clear to every disinterested observer of japanese affairs and it was evident that the question could no longer safely be left unsettled 
it was closely interwoven with matters which directly affected the welfare of the Japanese people, and it touched no less directly every foreign interest in Japan. The adoption of a constitutional form of government rendered the ancient treaty engagements absolutely untenable. The commercial and industrial progress of Japan, and especially the extension of railways throughout every part of the empire, made them impracticable and oppressive. Representations in this sense were urged upon the treaty powers, and finally new treaties were concluded, which are to go into effect in 1899, and by the terms of which Japan recovers all of the prerogatives temporarily suspended by the operation of the old treaties. This change in Japan's conventional status has a significance peculiarly its own. For the first time in the history of the international relations of Eastern and Western countries, an Oriental nation will be received upon a footing of perfect equality by Christian powers. Naturally, the Japanese people are gratified with this result, but that does not imply that those who inspire and direct national thought and progress regard this great change as a cause for self-gratulation merely. On the contrary, they fully understand that it will bring fresh cares and onerous responsibilities. They realize that Japan will be placed upon trial, as it were, and that the judgment of Christendom will depend upon the manner in which her government and her people acquit themselves of their new obligations. Under these circumstances, it would be folly to speak overconfidently, but I sincerely believe that my countrymen will pass through the ordeal with the approbation of just and impartial observers. I say this because I am certain that their ambition that Japan shall be recognized as a member of the family of nations, enjoying all the prerogatives of national sovereignty which belong to an independent commonwealth, has a more solid foundation than merely sentimental reasons or the gratification of self-esteem. The upward struggle of Japan has been steady and unremittent. Like all human effort, it has been marred by errors of judgment and mistakes in performance, but the patient purpose to attain a higher plane of national existence has always been present. This fact is understood by some of those foreign observers who have studied our progress, but others, and I regret to say the greater number, do not view our efforts so seriously. It is not a gracious thing to say, but many persons who discourse learnedly upon things Japanese never get farther than the discovery that Japan is in Asia. Because Asiatic nations do not, as a rule, care for those things or attempt those things which Japan values and seeks to attain, it appears to be taken for granted by such critics that Japan, being an Asiatic nation, has no serious purpose in striving to adopt Western civilization. Such reasoning has no weight, of course, with impartial students of human progress. But unfortunately, it does lead astray many who lack either the inclination or the opportunity to discover the truth. The answer is obvious. Asiatic peoples may differ as widely from each other as those of Europe or America. Because with one Asiatic nation, religion is an insuperable bar to progress, because another is perfectly satisfied with its present condition and refuses to adopt even the most obviously useful products of modern invention, it does not follow that all Asiatic nations are bigoted or lethargic. The difficulty, it seems to me, with many of those who attempt to explain our racial characteristics and national development is that they approach the subject with a preconceived idea of mysteries which do not exist. They are inclined to search for concealed motives and for hidden springs of action, when a simple and reasonable explanation lies upon the surface. Granted sincerity of purpose and honesty of effort, and there is nothing inexplicable in Japan's career during the past thirty years. The question of race has no valid title to prior consideration in the case, certainly none as a decisive factor. 
for a people who have shown aspiration for improvement and ability to attain a higher standard the only legitimate test is one that estimates the earnestness of effort and the measure of capacity whether japan will finally succeed or fail under such a test remains to be seen thoughtful japanese while confident of ultimate success recognize the obstacles which lie in the way experience has shown some of the difficulties in accomplishing a harmonious transition from the old to the new others remain to be overcome the rapid change from a feudal to a constitutional form of government with its attendant effects upon social conditions has created incongruities which only time can efface although a great deal has been accomplished a great deal remains to be done our material civilization is already sufficiently far advanced the moral and intellectual development of our people must be relatively much slower for that we must depend upon the diffusion of all the influences of western civilization which we welcome and promote by every legitimate means we have laid the foundation it now remains to complete the superstructure that i believe we can safely leave to the agencies already at work with an intelligent people willing to assimilate to their own use those elements of western civilization which tend to promote the welfare and happiness of mankind and with a land rich in natural resources it is safe to predict that the present transitory period will be safely passed japan is so new as a factor in the world's calculations so little studied and so little understood that her motives and her actions are sometimes seriously misconstrued this is a topic upon which i must speak with due caution but even at the risk of seeming impropriety i cannot allow the opportunity to pass of saying a word upon subjects which have lately been attracting widespread attention no citizen of this country should be ignorant of the fact that among the people of japan there is a genuine and deeply rooted attachment to the united states it is not a merely sentimental liking but a feeling founded upon the memory of many kindnesses received the united states has been a friend to japan helpful in the hour of need considerate at all times if there was a nation upon whose sympathy they could rely in the effort to improve their condition and of whose appreciation they were certain in whatever successes they might gain that nation the japanese people have thought was the united states such being the case the tone of many recent utterances in the american press will be to them like an angry blow from a friend that the american people should regard japan as an aggressor lustful of aggrandizement eager to quarrel and ready if need be for war will seem to them incomprehensible and that this clamor should have arisen because their government in pursuance of clear and legitimate duty has chosen to present in a respectful calm and moderate way certain reasons why a certain thing should not be done will add to the mystery there are jingoes in japan as a distinguished countryman of mine said the other day but i have heard of none so forgetful of rights of friendship and of interest as to make the declaration recently attributed to japan by a prominent american journal let us send a few warships to the united states this is a delicate subject i know but i cannot refrain from saying that americans especially should appreciate the solicitude which japan feels in the welfare of her subjects in foreign countries the japanese government has never permitted the establishment of anything like a coolie system among her people if they go abroad it desires that they shall go as men and not as numbers and it asks and expects for them the same treatment and the same protection as are accorded to other strangers whatever may be said to the contrary the japanese are not an emigrating people but 
to provide for all contingencies an immigration law has been enacted carefully framed to protect the emigrant and to prevent him from going to countries where he would not be welcome japanese emigration to hawaii involves this among other questions that emigration was instituted upon the solicitation of hawaii under the strictly guarded stipulations of a special treaty the welfare much less the independence of hawaii has never been endangered by the operations of that treaty on the contrary japanese immigration was zealously promoted and encouraged in the islands until political contingencies rendered another policy advisable japan did not seek the treaty but her people have been induced to resort to hawaii under the guarantees it provides and certainly no one with any sense of justice can now blame her for endeavoring to conserve their rights touching upon another yet a cognate subject it may be said most emphatically that the japanese nation has no tendency toward territorial aggrandizement neither in the past history of the empire nor in its modern annals can there be found any trace of such a spirit formosa was taken from china but that was in lieu of indemnity which it was inconvenient for china to pay besides the status of Formosa as an appendage of China has not always been strictly maintained. At one time, the Japanese, Chinese, and Dutch simultaneously occupied different parts of the island. More recently, Japan sent an expedition thither, with the consent of China, as was supposed, to punish the savages for their cruelty to shipwrecked seamen. Historically, therefore, there were close relations between japan and formosa the most conclusive reason however in favor of the cession of the island is that by geographical position it is a natural addition to the empire the cession of the liaotung peninsula is the only other instance of the forcible acquisition of territory by japan the peninsula was returned to china and although the return excited some popular disapproval it was not so much on account of the loss of territory as because of the manner of retrocession i repeat therefore that history affords no example of greed of territorial aggrandizement on the part of japan it is as foreign to the genius of her people as it is to the designs of her government the charge that she intends either by forcible seizure or by peaceful occupation to acquire possession of a country thousands of miles distant and totally without the sphere of her territorial influence can therefore only be accounted for in one of two ways it is either prompted by ignorance or by interested motives japan's real ambition lies in quite another direction in her geographical position her natural resources as well as in the capacity and adaptability of her people she perceives the surest means of attaining national greatness. The watchwords of the Japan of today are enterprise and industry. The people have turned their attention to commerce, to manufactures, and to the arts. They realize the advantages their country possesses and are doing what they can to utilize them. They may not yet have reached the full measure of their ambition, but they look forward hopefully to the time when japan will be the emporium of the orient firmly bound to her neighbors east and west by the strong ties of mutual interest toru hoshi end of the new japan by toru hoshi